let's go back and see why g of j omega is the frequency response. Why does s equal j omega when inserted into g give us the frequency response? So we'll go through our procedure, take the Laplace transform. That means that our output y equals g times u, and we know that uh, our u for a uh, sinusoid is going to be equal to the frequency of the sinusoid over s squared plus omega squared times g of s. So here's our Laplace transform. Then if we take the partial fraction expansion, but we're not interested in the steady state. We're interested in the steady state. So I don't really care about all the poles of g that are going to die out. At least I hope they die out. In any event, the frequency response is still designed. It's, it's defined as the poles that apply to the input. So if I were to do the residues of just the input poles, then I would have RP1 of S minus P1 plus RP2 of S minus P2, where P1 and P2 are the input poles, input, and they, they lie on the plus and minus J omega axis. They lie on the plus and minus J omega axis at P1 and P2. And they're also complex conjugates of each other, so we know that P1 equals P2 star, and vice versa. And that's going to mean that the complex numbers that represent the residues are going to be complex conjugates as well. So if we remember how to evaluate the residue for this particular input pole, again, that's the input pole, and that input pole is on the j omega axis, well, we multiply everything by s minus p1. So if we multiply everything by s minus p1, we see that I'm going to isolate our p1, and all the terms on the right are going to have s minus p1 in the numerator. So if I evaluate that expression at s equals p1, I notice that these are going to cancel, then I'll, our p1 will fall right out, and it'll be fall out, and it'll be equal to j, g of j omega times omega d over p1 minus p2. And it actually is that simple if you use phasers. And here, then, we see that g of j omega times omega over p2 minus p1, that's going to turn out to be equal to g of j omega times omega d over 2 omega d e to the j 90 degrees. The omega d's are going to cancel out. And this will leave me with my final answer, which is that g of j omega will be equal to g of j omega over 2 times e to the j minus 90 degrees. If I take that pole and bring it to the numerator. And, of course, this is going to be equal to a magnitude, magnitude of g of j omega over 2. And the angle will be the angle of g of j omega d minus 90 degrees. So we'll have a magnitude and an angle as shown for the residue. Now, as shown in class, we want the steady state value, so all I'm interested in are the input pole, a response for the input poles, and all the rest of these guys we assume are going to die out. And we know from a working class that the steady state output in time for uh, at a particular pole, evaluated at a pole, so in the steady state, is going to be equal to twice the magnitude of the residue times E to the value of the P1 real part times the cosine of omega dt minus the angle, or plus the angle of the residue. Now in our case, our magnitude was equal to g of j omega over 2, and our angle was equal to the angle of g of j omega minus 90 degrees. So when I substitute that into y steady state, 
I can see that the 2 times the magnitude is just going to be equal to g of j omega. The sigma is going to be 0 because I'm on the g omega axis. So I'll end up with the cosine of omega d t plus the angle of g of j omega minus 90 degrees. Then if I notice these two relationships here, we've already noticed that the sigma is equal to 0. I notice that the cosine of omega d minus 90 is the sine. So I'll end up with my steady state value equal to the magnitude of g of j omega times the sine of omega d t plus the angle of g of j omega. And that's because the angle of g of j omega, if you remember, was rp minus 90 degrees. And there you have it. And that's why the frequency response equals g with s equals to j omega. Because of the inverse Laplace transform of the steady state of the sinusoid function. That completes our intro.